Thank you, Matt. Please don't go far. We need your expertise for what is coming next, which is the panel discussion. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we now need to uh, invite to the stage, uh, we already have Matt Hatton. We're going to be joining, joined by several uh, of our speakers already. Um, Alexander Lautz, Professor Dr. Nico Grove, and uh, Thomas Jaschombeck from the CDU, all of whom please uh, are most welcome. Give them a round of applause. Can you? Are you able to arrange? Could you arrange them? Ah, oh, right, okay. We'll go for the casual look, as you say. Do we have uh, Thomas Jaschombeck? Um, in the absence of uh, Thomas, Matt, I'd like to start with you. I mean, you've very eloquently talked to us about the uh, challenges, or the uncertainties, and the quicksand nature um, of the uncertainty. Is IoT and M2M seem to be still caught between um, slow uh, standardization and very rapid proprietary developments? Um, it's a, a dichotomy that has troubled the industry from the get-go 20 years ago. Do you think we're getting closer to a resolution? Are we starting to see um, the political establishment, the regulatory establishment, starting to understand better the need to move quickly? Um, it's, it's a patchwork. Right, you get you have certain countries where yes, absolutely, there's 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 a recognition that there's a requirement to to, to move. Um, I'd single out Singapore, for instance, where they're taking a very aggressive approach to to encouraging, to pushing uh, M2M and IoT, and in fact the UK as well. So um, Ofcom just put out a. Um, uh, I am not sure what they call it. I I, I forget what they call it. Um, but, but the, it was relating to the growth of M2M and IoT. And this wasn't a question of how do we as a regulator regulate IoT, it's how, is, how do we as a regulator encourage the growth of M2M and IoT. And that's an interesting different, uh, difference of, of, of perspective. So the, Ofcom as a regulator is thinking about encouraging, nurturing, and, and this is a very, very positive uh, aspect. Um, I think there's, a, there's a, a broader question outside of regulation. I've kind of harped on about regulation uh, uh, in, in quite a, uh, a significant way. Um, but I think that, I mean, there's a, there's a wider set of questions on um, adoption and uh, some, some of the barriers to adoption. I mean, you, me you mentioned standardization. I think ultimately, um, broadly speaking, standards always win. There's a, um, uh, now there will be niches where uh, there will be some use of, of non-standard technologies. I think that's, that, that's inevitable. Um, and in terms of other, other barriers, I think there's a sort of an assumption um, around um, what people are doing, what the motivations are for, for M2M. And actually, the very, we've gone quite a long way through in terms of the adoption on um, M2M applications that are for efficiency savings, for, you know, it's relatively easy to sell. The, the interesting thing to watch is those M2M applications that are about fundamental changes in business processes, servitization, switching from CapEx to, to, to OPEX-related models. Um, and there's a, a business change and, and, and something of a, a mentality shift that needs to happen in order for that, that to occur. Sorry, I've rambled on a bit, so I'll... I'll no, I'll not, not at all. I, I think that's interesting. Nico, is there anything that you would add to these comments from Matt? Yeah, um, um, thanks. I'm, I'm agreeing, as you might have seen before, that in some parts regulation is a bit, let's say, weird. On the other hand, in other aspects, it's a quite good uh, thing, not only for the consumer, also for the industry itself in terms of uh, that's now the 
two-sided sword. On one hand, you have the Stiegler's theorem where you're saying that regulation becomes over time acquired by the industry. That means you doing the regulation yourself because you send all the lobbyists, for example, to Brussels or something, and then you get what you sort of beg for. However, through the process that a couple of these industry guys just joined there, there, there exists then in the end a lot of fragmentations. And that's something which I always sort of uh, not quite sure if we should get in regulation in a, in a deep dive process everywhere into every technological detail of something, or just agreeing uh, a lot there, just, just giving fundamental things like, uh, like we have in other legal things, like I shouldn't steal, and we just don't regulate, I shouldn't steal on a Sunday morning uh, a, a piece of bread or something. That's, that's the totally wrong way. And the same is true for standards. Uh, just let me quickly add that. We could really, if we beg for a standard for or regulation for a standard, let's say we have to have one until 2018 or something, we should and we would work on, and then we would have one. That's, that's sort of the thing. We could use that as an engaging driver to also work together better as an industry, and then it could work and maybe we do an economic vision or something a little later for, for mm -hmm. regulatory parts. They're just staying there at that discussion. Thank you. I mean, it, it, what we've done is, is look at the sort of the academic and the policy side, but I'd really like to look at the, uh, the nuts and bolts of actually delivering services. So, Alexander, um, can you think of examples of when this has challenged you, perhaps in uh, areas around private uh, data in telehealth or... Uh, location. Yeah. I, I very much subscribe to what we heard from Matt. Um, this is a lot of complexity. Uh, you said complexity trap, actually, uh, the data security part and these things. But, uh, but here, I think we cannot wait for the regulator, so we have to make the step as the industry towards the regulator and, uh, and the government to say we need uh, rules for this, but and they could look like this. And then we have then we in the discussion. So I, I liked it very much that you said all the data privacy uh, terms and conditions are set for natural persons. And now what's going on? So we have to put the terms and conditions in a different. We have to make proposals for that. I think that's something which we really missed. Uh, you said the numbering part. Everybody's talking about IP6. Fine, but what about the numbering schemes? I think when we go back 20 years, um, the GSM was a standard out of the industry on the technical part, and the numbering, personally, this was my second work um, week in my career. I was sent to the regulator on behalf of my company that time to talk about numbering schemes. But this is, I mean, this is something setting really a frame, which is very important, and, and here it's a lot of complexity for Europe. Uh, because of our national uh, regimes here, and this is something where American companies or Chinese companies they really wonder what we're going to do in Europe, but this is a chance, actually, which we can take as a, as a chance and which we have to take as a chance. So that's, I think, very much uh, underestimated um, challenges, but also chances. It is an opportunity. I, I wondered whether or not you felt that the uh, development that was announced last week, which was the... Um, GSMA's uh, launch of the embedded SIM um, specification was one of those significant steps forward that enables the industry to actually come together, reach a, a wide measure of agreement and take positive steps forward in deployment. Was this something that uh, you, you had sort of on your radar? As you said, I mean, the standards are very important. And um, so when there's, a, there's an, a step forward now, which is very important to do so, on the other hand, um, on the same day, we had already a launch of a consumer eSIM uh, product with the tablets of Apple in the US. So um, it's night that the GSM uh, uh, now has it, yeah, but I mean, um, the markets and the consumer pull is much faster. So, I mean, we have to speed up because we're, otherwise we end up in two worlds. We have then the consumer-driven ecosystems by two or three, let's say, so to say, monopolist uh, companies, but private companies, uh, or we have, and then we are 10 years late with all our, let's say, standards um, from, from, from uh, bodies like GSMA. But, uh, but I, I mean, we're, we're the M2M -M industry, right? So we're happy to see this development. I'm not sure that, that, that um, it, it's generally received with, the, or the Apple announcement at least, which is sort of a, 
it's kind of an adjacent thing and it's it's related but but in terms of the um the the um the gsma announcement welcome i think i think it's it's an incremental part and it's 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 not something that's a surprise it's something that's been worked on gradually um and it's another illustration of how um for me m2m requires a uh, a different set of um, capabilities from the traditional mobile services where you, you didn't take a foreign mobile phone and go and live in another country and use that phone there for, for, for a year. I mean, well, you could do, I suppose, but the, the costs would be, would be substantial. But for an M2M device, you, you could envisage it. And so the commercial realities associated with M2M are very different from the commercial realities associated with, with traditional uh, services. And so the regulation and the standards and a whole host of, of different te technical features also have to adopt, uh, sorry, adapt in order to, to, to meet those requirements. And that's, and that, that's what we're talking about, right? I, I couldn't uh, agree more. I think um, there are these opportunities, these risks, and we need to um, explore them. But I'd like to throw this open to the floor. Are there any questions from the floor? Anybody uh, have any burning issues they'd like to raise? Um, yes, in the front row, Jens Walker. Could we have a microphone here, please? Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to understand a little bit more how can we speed up. Uh, so we are discussing uh, since so many years of the development of the market, and I guess we overestimate uh, uh, the development of the market development. So what can we do in detail, especially in the B2C or B2E, B2B market? So and which market is speeding more up? <laughs> it's for the whole audience. <laughs> that, okay, that, that we do it this way. Um, I might focus today on, on a market you also just addressed. It's uh, all the um, handling with our user data. Sort of uh, might touch it a little, but I think the example is quite uh, good. Maybe we can identify markets where we could put ourselves in a position here, let's say as a secure, safe market also for for user data. Like, for example, a Deutsche Telekom uh, company, they recently bought that Strato guys. They're doing um, high standards on, on data security or something. I, please give me other names for doing advertising for other companies, but it was just an example. Um, the thing is, um, we were discussing um, a lot of times with a, a group uh, together, we joined there with, with uh, the Akatech and all a couple of guys there, what we should do, for example, for the cloud standards, especially in terms of uh, user rights, data protection, privacy. And there were a lot of guys always there saying, uh, we have to get rid of all these standards and uh, in order to compete there internationally. And we all were man, more in a position to say, let's raise them. We can sort of protect the market here by quality. We, we can address here a market where we have high standards and user protection, everything like this. And either you do your business here with these standards or you stay out. And if you have a high standard like this here, then maybe we sell that stuff internationally, also for health industry related stuff and anything like this. It's, it's another little example and then you help me out again. Uh, I was once discussing with uh, a former, one of the many guys there which uh, were le in led, uh, leading the, the Studio VZ portal, if any of you guys still know that. Um, he was blaming the entire German government there in that discussion, everyone, they should get rid of all these standards and I said, well, maybe you do an easy solution, get a nice office on a nice Caribbean island. Entire discussion st uh, stopped, and that's, that's it. So if you want to have a legal system, either go there or live with that one here, and maybe we should also focus there, especially on a user uh, safety, security, data protection business, because we have high standards here, and maybe we should could, and could implement them there. Um, a, a, few, a few thoughts. Um, first off, I mean, we all know this isn't one market. This is hundreds of different markets. Right. These are um, for all aspects of healthcare and automotive and, and uh, connected home and, and, and so on and so forth. There are hundreds of these markets and they all move at different paces. And, and um, uh, so it's a, it's a very fragmented space that we're, that we're looking at. But we know that. Um, the other aspect is that 
is the horizontal. Okay, so what more could the industry be doing? What more on a horizontal basis in terms of networks and services and, and commercial models and, and so on? The, the pace of change happening at the moment is, is phenomenal. Okay, um, it never ceases to amaze me how fast these things are moving, how fast the companies in this sector are adapting to the, to the changing dynamics. Now, we, we have a as a company, a few steers, a few ideas that we think of how, how the, um, the industry will, will evolve. But basically, you guys are, are doing it. You know, you're adapting to the changing dynamics of the, of, of the market. Now, it won't always be perfect, and there will be a few gaps. But broadly speaking, this, this market or this, this set of, of companies within M2M has adapted phenomenally quickly to a, a changing set of, set of environments. I was hoping to uh, have the opportunity to ask um, uh, Thomas Yashombek uh, from the CDU um, how they might be able, the government might be able to uh, address the issues and the challenges, um, particularly through the digital agenda that is being pushed in, in Germany at the moment. Um, if you had the ear of government, uh, Alexander, what would be the request that you would put to them to try and uh, assist in this process? Because a lot can be done within the industry, as Matt has uh, described, and in fact, a lot is being done within the industry. But there is a role for government, there is a role for outside parties. Yeah, I mean, um, one thing which is very obvious, which we have to do, is the, in the, is the industrial optimization sector, where we have to have, well, we have the chance and opportunity to have uh, technical standards, but also legal standards, um, uh, data security standards, so we can, and this is actually, these are the customers of us in, in Europe. Many of our economies really have strong players in that, in that area. So for the consumer part, I have a view where I say, oops, maybe we have to partner with the strong guys, yeah? But in the, in, the business, well, in the business sector, this is a natural play, actually. Tomorrow, there's the IT, IT Gipfel. Um, so there are initiatives, and there's the digital uh, agenda in Germany, but it, it shouldn't be a German thing. Yeah? It's the, the industry optimization part is a, is a European one. Uh, it's for both Western and Eastern Europe, so it's really a chance for us to to set here a role, like GSM came from, from Europe, and maybe it's not, not only a technical one, I, I like the discussion around the regulation and, and these things, so there's really a chance. And so what we have to do now to come up, what, what can be, how can we speed up, to find not only drive it out of the technical or supplier uh, arena, what we are right in, but um, to have really also forerunners like industry-led uh, companies, consortium, to say, we need that. So whenever Alcatel is not really uh, European anymore, but I mean, whenever Siemens uh, uh, is, is really saying, this is what we want to do, um, I mean, I think this has a big impact. So I think we must get it from the Mittelstand or from the industry optimization sector, and they must understand that they must lobby for it, because in the end, it's their benefit. Yeah? We are just the supplier network. Mm. Matt, did you have anything to add on that? Y yes. Um, no. No, I'm going to park it no, there. That's fine. No, <laughs> Nico, you've been uh, active in the sort of public policy uh, space. There, there is a role here for organisations like the M2M Alliance uh, in speaking to the public, in un getting the public to understand not only the benefits, but that they understand the risks and that the industry as a whole is dealing with the risks. The, the risks I'm thinking are of privacy of data, particularly in areas like um, M-Health, mobile health, telehealth. Um, do you think that the industry could be doing more right now uh, to get the message over to the public uh, that we understand the concerns that they may have and that they are being addressed and we can move forward so that uh, there are no um, concerns in public uh, perception. Yeah, that's, that's uh, related to the topic we just, or I just discussed. Uh, in terms of the health sector, that would be also a very good example, uh, combining that with uh, your argumentation also in specific areas here, buy a solution by one of the guys here. And these are also areas where we can restrict 
the market without having problems with the WTO, uh, WTO or something like that, because we say that is already in place that, uh, for example, uh, health related data can't be processed out of the, uh, outside of the European Union. And if you just imagine if you have a big outsourcing center uh, from uh, one of the outsourcers there in India and there are 20,000 guys, the one works for the one company, the other one for the next one, and they interchange also our health data, that's something we can really focus on. It sort of could stay here. Also the technical standards could they implement it locally and maybe we we'll sell that stuff later. Um, for the first part of your question, how you could address that, um, we are doing that, in, as, you, as you said, in many of these platforms. And the problem is also, uh, it's, it's always that the approach of explaining things there is getting again to the detail. Nobody understands it, then they're on a high level platform. So it really must be, and that's really the high, high skill task. Uh, in a nutshell, and uh, maybe. Um, leaving aside a couple of very important details for some of the players or something, but otherwise it won't work. That's the same in regulation. If you always come ahead there with big explanations, like uh, we have lots of discussion with the Deutsche Telekom, what we should do with all this VDSL whatsoever, standard with any fancy mechanism, they're sitting a couple of guys at the regulator and they don't understand anything and they just go inside a room later and decide, okay, let's do number one. Yeah. Uh, Alexander, are you finding this to be a... I mean, uh, they're very competent, don't get me wrong, but it's, it's like when you really put too much information on these guys. Sorry, it shouldn't be like we have... Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Hope. Alexander, you. Yeah, are you finding the, such concerns to be real-world concerns amongst your customers' uh, customers? Oh, uh, you mean the... In privacy. Um, the customers' customers, like thinking in B2B2C models. What yes. So, um, that's uh, actually a, a very good point, because... Um, they're taking the automotive sector, not, not the industrial automation, but the automotive sector. Um, this is purely B2B2C, because in the end, it's a service which must be of benefit for the driver of the car. And uh, so um, we see this um, as, a, as a very big, let's say, chance for us to, to build more B2B2C models and to think in B2B2C value chains um, to make, let's say, to make it happen for the, for the M2M sector. Uh, because the, the last step is always missing, or let's say, or not always, but it's often missing. We, we're talking about, oh, this is a cool thing, and we do it together with uh, Telit and Jasper and Telecom and so on, and that's nice, but the last step is missing, and it all comes from the benefit for those who pay for it. And even if it's, um, it's, it's a, in the end, it's a consumer who has to pay for it, uh, or if it's a production plant, I mean, maybe then we're different. But here, we have to think more in this detail, and this is what I wanted to show with my simplicity approach. It must be very simple from that point in time, because whenever, I'll give you an example, I'll give you an example, this is what is not 100% B2B to C, but in an example. Recently we have been with a company who is doing um, sewing machines to, to, uh, to, uh, to make um, uh, um, um, sneakers, and, uh, and they recognized, um, okay, we don't have to bring um, a service agent to Bangladesh whenever there's something crap, and we can do it remotely, which saves us per incident $5,000. Yeah, so they think, oh, this is possible. Yeah, so we're talking about these things. So, I mean, there are a lot of things we have to really to go into these use cases and into these um, into this, um, yeah, benefits for the customers. Uh, can I just hop back to the data privacy uh, qu means, question, yes. question a, a, a little means. bit? Um, when I described how regulators were typically a little bit behind the curve on uh, new technology, I mean, that ge generally, I think that's a, that, that is a fair thing. Uh, technology changes very quickly. Regulation has to, has to keep up. When it comes to data privacy, though, actually, they've kind of gone out in front, particularly here in, in, in Europe. So um, with the new data privacy regulations that are coming through, which include Google's right to be forgotten, but they're not, it, n that's not, that's only one small part of, part of it. Um, we think they've actually got, got, got out in front a little bit. Um, with the interesting dynamic that there's, there's the setting of some rules around um, uh, when data can be shared across international borders, which is typically based on reciprocity. So if you have the same rules as we have, mm. then, then you, can, you can share, share data. 
um, which basically makes the EU standards the de facto global standard for data privacy, because any other country that wants to exchange data with an EU country has to put in place regulations that are more or less the same as, as, as those. So there's an interesting dynamic there. The other interesting dynamic for me is um, uh, EU-wide super regulators. There's been quite a lot of talk about that recently, um, and uh, yet, yet to see actually what, what might come, come through from, uh, from that. Anyway, I'll park it there. Mm. Um, there's one last opportunity for any questions from the floor. If anybody has a point that they would like to raise, we have experts at your beck and call. No, okay. Uh, I can't let you go without um, one last uh, investigation into a point that Matt raised in his keynote, uh, which was regarding the uh, permanent roaming solutions. I mean, he highlighted three. Correct me if I've got these wrong. I was um, scribbling them down quickly, Matt, but um, sliding scale of, of roaming rates for low megabit usage, a distinguish, you, the need to distinguish M2M devices, or uh, uh, ban permanent roaming. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Those, those are three options. I'm not, three options. I'm not saying that there aren't others, but those, no. the, those are three obvious ones. If, if I could, could you, um, each of you, give your... Uh, ideas on which you think is the most likely, any of those three or none of the above? Could I start with you, Alexander? Actually, um, the, for, for us, the, the scenario is that we have to be prepared for everything. So we, have, we cannot make our choice when 78% um, of the countries are not decided what, what, what we yeah. have to follow. So we have to be prepared. So what we do now is we have three parallel developments in our company, which is driving complexity and costs a lot of money. And this is not really, not really good. So we are, we are, if there would be a decision for one, I mean, we can say, OK, this is the decision, and we can implement on that one. Mm. Yeah, in a way, the, 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 it, it doesn't matter, in a way. Now, obviously, you'd rather, rather have permanent roaming be permitted, but it's the uncertainty that gets you every time. And, that, and that's the challenge. It's not yeah. that, that any one of those is better than any other. I mean, the neatest solution to me seems to be um, to, to um, uh, tweak the regulation around uh, the, the uh, regulated roaming rate, just so that at one megabit, it's not the same per meg rate as it is at one gigabit, gigabyte. Nico. Well, uh, I think that's the same uh, issue like we had for uh, national roaming, uh, meaning interconnection. Um, it's also a thing, maybe it sounds nice earning a couple of millions by roaming. However, if you pay for roaming, also a couple of millions, so in the end, it's depending, yeah, you, you have market size models for that. If you're the bigger one, most of the cases you are earning a little bit out of that one. But the administration part of that one is massive. So in the end, maybe for a unique European market, I would go, not personally, but from a European perspective, from the Commission also for just get rid of that. Because in terms of just if company one sends a bill to the other one and sends it back later, it's just administration. Hmm. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for being so generous with your time and your opinions and giving us each your M2M perspectives. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, concludes the uh, first session for today. And uh, I'm delighted to say that we will now break for you to enjoy a wonderful buffet lunch and a chance to tour the exhibition. Please make the most of both. We look forward to seeing you back here at uh, 2 o'clock. Until then, thank you. <laughs>